Continuing in Genesis, and we're in uh, Genesis uh, 17 uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to look at several verses there, and we're going to talk about being established. And uh, I'm going to read the verses, and then we'll make some comments, and I'll make some as we go through. And then we'll look at some other things and some questions. Uh, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him saying, I am God Almighty, live in my presence and be blameless or complete and sound. I will set up my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell face down and God spoke with him. I think I'd have fallen face down too if he comes straight to me and <laughs> speaking to me. As for me, here is my covenant with you. Notice he's going to mention covenants five times in these verses that we're looking at just in this first part. Uh, I will set up my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell to face down and God spoke with him. As for me, here's my covenant with you. You will become the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, which means exalted father. Your name will be Abraham, which means exalted father of, of the Jewish nation or of a nation. For I will make you the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful and will make nations and kings come from you. I will confirm my covenant that is between me and you and your future offspring throughout the gener their generations. It is a permanent or everlasting covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring after you. And to you and your future offspring, I will give the land where you are residing, all the land of Canaan as a permanent or everlasting possession. And I will be, I will be their God. God also said to Abraham, as for you, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations are to keep my covenant. This is my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you, which you are to keep. Every one of your males uh, must be circumcised. Uh, then in, uh, starting in uh, verse uh, 15, uh, God said to Abraham, as for your wife, Sarai, do not call her Sarai for Sarah will be her uh, name, which uh, means prince's wife of Abraham. I will bless her indeed. I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will produce nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abram fell face down. Then he laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a hundred year old man? Can Sarah, a 90 year old woman give birth? So Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael were acceptable to you. But God said, no, your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son and you will name him Isaac. I will confirm my covenant with you with him as a permanent covenant for his future offspring. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will certainly bless him. I will make him fruitful and will multiply him greatly. He will father 12 tribal leaders and I will make him into a great nation. But I will confirm my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this uh, time next year. When he finished talking with him, God withdrew from Abraham. Uh, all right, there are many things in life that require our trust, uh, but cause us to question, amen? A lot of times we uh, are required to move. A lot of times we uh, are, ha have to talk about job situations and, and so forth, kids, family, whatever. Uh, sometimes we may even question God, you know? Sometimes we might. And sometimes we question God, but we do it in a little different way so that it doesn't look like we're exactly questioning God. Uh, but God's thoughts and his ways are not our thoughts and our ways, so we have to trust him. Remember, God had established his covenant with Abram when he was 70 years old, and now our verses said uh, that he was 99 years old. Sarah encouraged Abram to take Hagar, her slave. You remember we talked about that and to have a son because they didn't have an heir. And that was sort of the custom uh, in that day if you didn't have a male heir to carry your name on. Uh, Ishmael was not the one that God had promised them uh, for them, for the heir, for his heir to come. Um, the Bible says that Abraham was blameless, which means he was entire or whole or complete. It doesn't mean he was perfect. 
Uh, this was to be an everlasting covenant. And you remember we talked a few weeks ago about uh, what a covenant meant back then. They took an animal and cut it in half and put the halves out there and they would walk between it, saying that if they broke that covenant, that they would want God to do that to them. So that's a little bit different than putting a signature on a paper <laughs> like, we do, like we do today. Uh, this is um, 4,000 years later, Abraham's descendants still possess much of that same territory. Uh, okay, uh, God said he would bless them, which means to endure with power for success. Uh, the new son was to be called Isaac, meaning he laughs, as a reminder of Abraham laughing when uh, God told him that. The descendants of Isaac and Ishmael have been at war with each other ever since and will continue to be at war with each other. Uh, any, any questions? Any comments? Anything? All right. And remember, these two, Ishmael and Isaac, came from Abraham. So, uh, and this is, I uh, probably shouldn't even got in this, but I did. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a confusing thing with the Muslims, the Arabs, and the, and the Jews. Uh, but actually, Ishmael came from uh, uh, Abraham just like Isaac did. But it was a different situation because God, God did not, uh, uh, that wasn't God's plan through Ishmael. Of course, you know, he knew everything. He knew what, what it would be. But all really are children of Abraham. Uh, the Muslims and the Arabs... Uh, at least in some way come from Ishmael, the Jews from Isaac, uh, and Muhammad also from uh, the Arabs and Muslims and down through that. Uh, both the Jews and the Palestinians claim Jerusalem as their capital, and they continue to fight over that today. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a terrible thing, but it's been going on forever. And they will never, until Jesus returns and and gets things settled, never be complete peace uh, in the Middle East. Okay? And that's probably enough to be said about that. Amen? Well, both sides need Jesus. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Even though we see one side is a little bit different than the other side, they all need Jesus. It's Hamas spirit versus Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's exactly right. All right, what are some reasons for our trust for God to be, what are some reasons that our trust for God is tested? What happens that causes us to at least a little bit have a, uh, a slack time in our faith and our trust in God? Sickness. Sickness, Sickness is one of the main things. Especially with your children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with children because we, don't, we just don't understand, do we, why these things... I mean, we understand if we uh, do things uh, against our own bodies, a doctor may tell us, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, and we continue to do this and this and this, then we know what happened to us. But a child, we, we, just, can't, we just can't wrap our minds around that, why this has to happen. So, so sicknesses ha uh, cause that, and death... Right along with that, what else? Loss of jobs. Loss of jobs, especially when we feel like we were doing right mm -hmm. and that we were led to that job maybe by God and then it doesn't work out. It causes us to have a little bit of lack of trust. What else? What about our prayers? When we feel like our prayers are not answered, we begin to... Our, our trust begins to go away just a little bit. Okay, what causes us to not trust those around us? Why do we get in a situation with a certain person or a certain group of people to not trust them? What causes that? We make gossip. We, gossip? Okay. Hmm? We make decisions without <clears throat> praying about it. First. All right, make decisions without praying about it. Carl? They don't all right, they don't believe how we believe. That causes their actions to be different than ours. Deception. Mm 
if they lie to us or lie about us, then we we don't trust them, do we? And and how do we how does that trust get built back up? All right, you confront them, and then what happens? Reckon. I mean, different things can happen. They can either admit it and ask forgiveness, or they can deny it and continue the, the broken relationship. Uh, but trust, trust uh, really has to be established, you know? And this lesson is talking about it, establishing things. Uh, so if you have someone that you're at least an acquaintance with, maybe a friend, uh, and they lie about you to someone, and you find out and you go to them, uh, what has to happen for that trust to be reestablished? What has to happen? And does it, does it, does it happen that quick? No, I, I mean, it, it can, but a lot of times it don't. Depending on how deep the hurt is, but you, know, you still gotta love them. And for me, it would take you know, all the love brought back into me to build up that trust with that mm -hmm. person. So, so maybe what we're saying is we, uh, for, we can forgive them because we have to forgive, we have to love because God, God commands us to do that. But we're human. So God forget, forgives and forgets. We can't really totally forget, not right away anyhow. So we can forgive, but we're usually cautious, <laughs> you know. Say a person... Uh, comes to us and says, I'm in, a, I'm in a bad financial situation and I need $1,000. Could you help me? Uh, and they're somewhat of a friend of yours. Better be a real good friend for $1,000. <laughs> and you loan it to them. And they say, 30 days, I'll have this and I'll give it back to you. Well, 30 days come, 60 days, 90 days, and you don't ever get it back. Then, six months later, they come to you for the same thing. Do you give it to them then? No. Oh, no. Okay. Because that trust has not been reestablished. Mm -hmm. But if that person in 30 days gives that back to you, then you pretty well have that relationship restored. Uh, so uh, when we get uh, spiritual things involved, uh, we know that God's command is that we love the person, that we forgive the person, but I really think you read the entirety of Scripture. You also have a right to be cautious, and, and especially when a person does it over and over and over. You still may forgive them, but you still watch out for them because those things, those things, trust is something that has to be built. Uh, you, you, you meet someone for the first time, and they want you to do something really drastic. You, you're... You're cautiously not going to do it, probably, you know, because you don't even know them very well. You get someone that you've known for years and trusted for years, you're more likely to do it. So what, I was, what I'm trying to say is once that trust is broken, then it's going to take a while to build that back up, mm -hmm. probably longer than it did to start with, because once you're hurt and someone said how deep the hurt is you know if the hurt is sure enough deep it's going to take a longer period of time to build that up that doesn't mean you have to shun them that doesn't mean you have to talk bad about them that doesn't mean that you can't be somewhat of a friend to them but it does mean that that trust that you once had has to be built back up if, if somebody breaks your trust they they'll be the ones that shuns you uh, yeah, yeah probably so probably so they can always turn the other way too. Yeah. All right. So uh, the the fact about God is we should know without a doubt that He is not going to deceive us, and He's not going to take advantage of us. Uh, he will discipline us. Uh, if that is the need, and that comes a time to do that. So our trust in him uh, has to be, uh, let me think. 
I would say it has to be different than trust in individuals because any individual can go back. I know when, when my daddy was having to go through a lot of physical uh, problems and, and he wanted me to talk to the doctors and make the decisions and I told him, you need to sign this, daddy. He said, I already told you, I want you to do it. Uh, I said, Daddy, we're not in the 1950s anymore. Handshakes, handshakes and word of mouth are no good. If it's not written down, it's not going to happen. And he said, well, I don't know what y'all trying to do to me. I'm going to sign it, but I, I don't know what y'all trying to do to me. So, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, with, with person to person, it's different than person to God. Because God, we know, is not going to deceive us, is not going to go back on us. And th that has to do with these covenants that, that he made with Abraham. All right. Um, the relationships that we have uh, with God uh, and our obedience to him uh, are not always the same. In other words, are we always perfect? No. So we're going to break that relationship we have with God. That doesn't mean that we're not his anymore, but it means that the relationship with him may be different. Uh, we come to church and maybe even listen to radio and maybe even sing on our own songs, but do we listen to the words that we're singing? You know what I'm saying? Uh, we, uh, we, we're really, to me, promising God things when we're singing those songs. And if you think about them, I should have written some of them down. But when you're thinking about them, there's a lot of things we're singing and saying that really don't compute real quick in our minds because we've known them so long and we've sung them so long. Uh, but we ha I think we ought to be careful that we are not uh, sitting here and God listening to us and we're, we're kind of telling him, whatever you say, I'll do, you know, and things like that. And then we go right out and do just the opposite. So uh, our relationship to him and our obedience to him can be can be different, uh, and and a disobedience to him causes a, a fracture in our relationship, and the way we get that relationship back is go to him and confess our sins, and uh, and turn from our sins so that we can do that. Uh, how can future generations be blessed by our faith in God? How can future generations be blessed by our faith in God? Our children. All right, to our children. We plant a seed, and it may not come up immediate, but it will sometimes. All right, we plant seeds, and then whose responsibility is it for those seeds to grow? It's us. God gives the increase. Okay, God gives the increase, and the person that has the seed planted in them has to be responsible for that. We can't be responsible for that. I can't make anyone around me do it. Well... Sometimes I guess we can make somebody do something, but but it may not be <coughs> it may not be genuine when that person does it or doesn't do it. Uh, so we are responsible to God to do the things He commands us to do with people, but people then are responsible to God, not really to us, to carry those things out. We tell a person, look. <coughs> That line you're doing is wrong, and you don't need to be doing it. Well, they're not responsible to us, really, you know, unless maybe they're lying about us, but they're really responsible to God then. And, and so we plant the seeds, like was said, of uh, telling somebody what's right and what's wrong. We plant the seeds of telling them uh, that the only way to eternal life is through Jesus Christ. Then it's up to them to make that decision. Uh, I think Larry said God brings the increase. The Bible says that. That, you know, I can, I can pray for someone. I can tell someone about eternity. I can tell someone about their sin. I can tell someone about their lifestyle. 
over and over and over. But I'm not the one that can bring about the change, and I'm not the one that's responsible for the change. I'm responsible to let them know the truth. And then they're responsible to carry out that truth with their, with their relationship with God. Once that seed starts to grow, and we can water the plant, we can pull the weeds from around it, and do things like that. Okay, so our, our responsibility, then what you're saying is maybe that our responsibility doesn't stop when we plant the seed, but we have to be careful uh, not to badger a person, you know? Yeah. I've been to see people before and shared the gospel with them, and then their family has wanted me to go back over and over and over, and I, I say, look, I told them, and when I told them, I assure you the Holy Spirit touched their heart. But if they don't ever respond, I can't do anything about that. And for me to keep badgering them, the best thing for a person, the best thing to do for a person that's not a Christian is to somehow get them in Bible study or a, or a service. Because I call it the rifle approach and the shotgun approach. I go to somebody's house and talk directly to them, that's a rifle. For those of you that don't know what a rifle and a shotgun are, a rifle has one bullet, you know. And, and when I go to that house, it's like a rifle. I'm, I'm, they're right there and I'm right here and they're getting it, you know. But in here, a person could sit and it's like a shotgun approach. I'm slinging it all out everywhere. And, and the person is not as uh, defensive in a situation like this as they are if you're, I, I know I went uh, and, and Jeff McCoy that's, that was here a period of eight years with the Air Force, four years one time, four years again in Texas now. Uh, he was with me and we went to visit somebody and it was a, they put the wrong address on the card. So this young man came to the door and he said, those people don't live here. I said, well, this is the address they gave us. So I asked him, I said, well, what, 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 about, what about you? What's your relationship to the Lord? And he backed up about two steps because it was direct approach. You know, he was directly approached by the gospel message. It wasn't me he was shunning from. It was the Holy Spirit that he was shunning from. Uh, and, and, and that's the that's difference. Uh, uh, I, I visited a lady one time, had some people with me. We visited a lady that was a friend of, a, of another person that was here. And... Uh, then they wanted me to go back again. I said, no, the best thing you can do is get her in church and Sunday school. And she eventually accepted Christ. But uh, I also visited a man and told me he'd already accepted Christ. Told me when it was, where it was, the pastor that was there, and the date. And then his, wife, his uh, sister said, you need to go back, he's lying to you. <laughs> I said, well, he might be lying to me, but I'm not going to go back and tell him he's lying to me. If he's lying, the Holy Spirit will have to deal with him after that. Uh, so, you know, that that's to me is the difference with, with, with what we're talking about. If you get them in a situation where they hear it, and the Holy Spirit can work on them without it being, without them having to be totally defensive, it, it makes it it makes it a better situation. So, uh, uh, future generations can be blessed by our faith in God. Our kids, uh, 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 co-workers, neighbors, family, uh, anybody could be blessed because uh, while they're living, uh, we can we can say things, do things, hopefully to help them out. But even after we're dead, you know. We can remember things. God will bring, the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance, I believe, the things that that person did, the things that that person might have said. Uh, okay, this is right along with that. Do our choices today affect those who follow us? Yes, it does. Uh, our kids, especially. Uh, those we teach, those we work with, uh, and so forth. Why do we sometimes offer our own plans, knowing it may not be what God wants or has said? Why do we do our own thing when we know it may not be what God has said for us to do? It's easy. It's easy? All right. It is, isn't it? It's like, for the time being. It's like the Abram, he, when he, he went into Hagar, he didn't trust God's plan. 
he thought it was going to he was going to have to make the move instead of God. God uh huh. He would. So so maybe he got impatient. Yeah. So impatience then can cause that. We want it when we want it, how we want it, the way we want it, and God better cooperate. Better be careful what you ask. That's right. Be careful what you ask for. But God says, I want it the way I want it, when I want it, the way I want it, and you better cooperate. And another thing that I read, is, uh, you know, at first God told Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. He'd have many, many offspring. Mm -hmm. But he never said at first it would be through Sarah. He said you will. Mm -hmm. So maybe they had that in the back of their mind too. I don't know. He didn't tell them until later. No tell them what they were thinking. No, who knows. All right, maybe selfishness also can cause us to to do things, you know, that yeah. that we uh, that we we may know it's not exactly what God said, or we may question what God said. Like Satan caused <clears throat> Eve to question that, and Satan can cause us to question. We might that. think that we'll get the glory instead of God. All right. All right, so maybe uh, stubbornness, not faithful. Uh, our timing is not his timing, and so we, we think that it's time for something to happen. Sometimes we think it's way past time for something to happen, and maybe we want it to happen. We want to make it happen. And, the, and some people say that's what happened with Judas, that he felt like, which the, the Jewish people did feel like, that Jesus was going to overthrow the Romans, and maybe Judas was thinking, well, if I go ahead and trigger that, <laughs> then it'll happen. So we can sometimes, uh, uh, our timing is not, is not the way that, uh, of God's timing. Why are God's plans always best? They're his. They're his. And he knows best. And he knows everything. He knows the future, he knows the future as well as the past and the present. Uh, how do we know God's plans? From past experience. Past experience, okay. How else? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit <laughs> speaking to us. Divine the divine Word of God <laughs> that we study. Through all His blessings. Uh, all His blessings. Uh, uh, answered prayers. Answered prayers. Uh, faithful Christians that we can turn to. But we always have to be careful because the Bible says discern the spirit you know the spirits so make sure that that person because let, let, let me say this it's easy for me say to have someone that somebody has done something wrong to them more than once it's easy for me to say you need to be done with that person isn't it easy to do that but we don't always know the whole situation and the whole story. And sometimes we, it's easy for us to guide people the wrong way uh, because there's always three sides to every story. There's this one and this one. And I used to say the truth, but I don't say the truth anymore. I say the way people feel because, because this person may feel like they're, they're uh, acting in truth. And this person may feel like, a, a good example of that in the Bible is Paul going to Jerusalem. You remember? Paul said, the Holy Spirit has spoken to me to go to Jerusalem. The people around him said what? The Holy Spirit has spoken to us, and if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to die. Now, I believe that the Holy Spirit spoke to both of them. And, and both of them was the truth. He wanted to go and needed to go to Jerusalem. That was what God was leading him to do. But these people said the truth. He was going to end up dying with it, and, and he did. So uh, you have this person's opinion, this person's opinion, and then you have uh, this person may be acting in what they think is really the truth. Or, and other times this person will be acting when they know it's a lie, but, but they do it anyhow. Uh, and so we have to just be careful. Uh, and, and, and we need to have godly people we can depend on. But 
they taught us in counseling, counseling in seminary, counseling is not what you know necessarily to always tell somebody. It's to listen to people and then look at all the options. You know what I'm saying? And when somebody comes to you and they have a work situation, you know, uh, we mentioned that a while ago, and they say, I'm ready to leave. Well, first thing you do, what is it going to do if you leave tomorrow? Do you have another job? <laughs> do you have any income? Do you have anything to fall back on? You know, I had a lady come in my office one day crying, and she said, I just, I just quit my job. I said, do you have another one? No. I said, well, <laughs> it's better to kind of, and she said, well, I'd put up with that as long as I could. And I, I said, I understand. And sometimes we have to do that. But, but when, we're, when we're talking to people, it's good always to ask them, now, what are your options? You know, what can you do? Okay, I can stay in this job, and I can put up with this abuse that I'm getting uh, and still have an income, or I can start looking everywhere I can to find me another job, and I'm still got to put up with this until I find me another job, or uh, I can quit. And I can, and what happens if I quit? Well, I have no money to fall back on. I can't pay my rent. I can't pay my car payments. I can't pay my house payments. I can't buy food for myself. I can't take care of my kids, you know. So then, then a person has to, has to say, and this is what I always try to do in counseling, not tell somebody what to do, but to give them all their options and then say, will you do this? I had a lady one time that, didn't want to go in the nursing home. And I wasn't trying to talk her into going in the nursing home. I was trying to ask her all that. I, I knew what that, I knew what she, I knew what the only thing really she could do, but I wasn't gonna tell her. I let her tell herself. And I asked her, can you do this? No, can you do this? No, can you do this? No, can you do this? No. I said, well then, what's your other option? My other option is to stay here in the nursing home. I mean, go into the nursing home part. I said, well, is that going to make you happy? Well, no, it's not going to make me happy, but I don't have any other choice, do I? I said, I'm not, I'm not making that decision. You just told me there's no other choice. So she made the choice, and then she's, she's at least she didn't come back to me two weeks from then and said, you told me the wrong thing, <laughs> you know? Uh, so uh, we, that's the best thing to do with people, to, to protect you and to let them go through it in their mind that this may not be what I want to do, but this is all I can do. You know, I mean, if, you, if you're in a job situation that's terribly abusive, you may just have enough that day and you may have to leave. Whether you, whether you have any, anything waiting or not, you just have to trust God and tell him, look, I've put up with this as long as I'm going to put up with it. And it's time, I, I got to leave. And then you have to leave and you have to trust God that, that he's gonna take care of you in those situations. Sometimes, I mean, not, I mean, in most cases, yes. In some situations, that's the devil working around that person to make them feel like they don't wanna be there. Mm -hmm. And then once that person says, I'm leaving, I can't take it no more, then, then that's when they start losing faith in God. Because that's the devil working around. Mm -hmm. trying to it can them definitely be. I, I knew a person one time that the reason he lost his job every time was his fault. But gracious, it seemed like he had a better job within a week every time. I mean, Kat and I talked. I said, I don't understand this. How can this happen? This I know he was smart and he... he he had a lot going for him, but it was his fault every time he lost his job. But it was probably three or four different times. But within a week, he had a better job, better pay. And, of course, he always lost them too. But, <laughs> but you know, that's just a terrible situation. Sounded like a victim. Uh, a victim well, a uh, victim. Uh, I know somebody else. <laughs> I, guess, I guess you could say a victim, but... A victim of his circumstances, circumstances. Of his, a victim of his actions. Mm -hmm. Yes.
So no. Does he need the zipper? No, he, uh, yeah, he needed a zipper, but not from talking. <laughs> <laughs> from what was going in there. <laughs> what does it mean to live in God's presence? What does it mean to live in God's presence? He, 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 uh, God, uh, he talked to him here about uh, live in my presence and be blameless or be complete, be whole. We have to be humble. Have to be humble? Why do we presence. have to be humble? Because he's God and we're flesh. Okay. Yes, sir. Live by vicariously through him. All right. He ran and he tested. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I think we have to have constant communication with him, mm -hmm. you know? Prayer. Uh, we don't have him, when we get home at night, say, walk in the door and he's standing there. But we need to realize when we walk in the door, he's standing there. And, when, and before we open the door, he was there with us. And he's always with us. And he's always going to be there with us. And it's not going to be written on the wall. Uh exactly what to do as it has been and times past in the Old Testament. But if we stay in constant communication with him, we pretty well, I think, gonna know what to do. You know, sometimes when people have asked me if I would do something, I haven't had to say I need to pray about it because I've already been praying that whatever, and, and I'm talking about things I know God sent there. I don't, I'm not talking about just anything that comes along. Don't ask me for a thousand dollars when we get through. <laughs> but you know, huh? What about two I saw I saw somebody out eating the other night, and he said, uh, "I should have got here sooner so you could pay for mine." I said, "Look, if you if you need me to pay for your meal, I got it right here." He said, "I don't need you to pay for my meal." I said, "Okay, I just want to be sure." I knew I didn't, but I knew what he was going to say. Uh, but anyhow. <laughs> Constant communication means prayer, Bible study, uh, being around God's people, uh, listening as well as we can to God through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then we know what godly decisions he would have for us to make. Read his word every day. Read his word every day. Study it. Yes. How does God give us his go ahead today? How do we know when to go ahead and when to wait? And sometimes it's not just that easy. How do we know? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Prayer. Hmm? Doors open. But be careful who opens the door. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> sometimes we don't. Want, sometimes we don't want to walk through. <laughs> Knock on the door may not be Jesus. That's right. Who's that knocking on the door? Right. That's right. So. We pray all the time, we stay prayed up, we study God's word, and I believe most all the time, if not all the time, if we're praying, if we're reading God's word, when a decision comes for us, something that we've prayed about or read about is going to lead us to do right. It might even seem like God is right there with you, speaking to you, hadn't it? I know a man, I, I did his funeral years ago, and uh, every time he prayed, and you might say, well, he shouldn't have did that every time he prayed, but it touched hearts every time he prayed. He had a bad accident, and they told him, told his wife he wasn't gonna live. And he told me, and told others, and prayed every time he prayed, it was in his prayer, that Jesus came and sat on his bed while he was in a coma and told him, I'm not through with you yet. Amen. I'm gonna bring you through. And I believe that because when he prayed, let me tell you, it was as if Jesus had come back to him again. And so uh, we, we stay close to God and I believe that he'll give us what we need. Not always easy. And sometimes we think it's right and we get down the road with it a little ways and realize it wasn't, and don't continue to be hard-headed. Just say, 
I made the wrong choice. Go back and start over and make the right choice then. Same way with dealing with people, same way with raising kids to me. You know, I always told the kids, I'm gonna do what I think is right. You may not think so, but I'm gonna do what I think is right. But if we get to go in and I see it's wrong, I'm gonna say I was wrong and back up and we're gonna do right then. So it was real easy with, it was easy sometimes and difficult sometimes, you know? All right, thank you all very much. And uh, we will continue uh, next week uh, in Genesis. And then I believe we'll go into something different and I don't have it with me to see what it is, but I think it'll be something in the New Testament, okay? It may not be, we may be continuing on, but whatever it is, we'll do it, right? Amen. Father, we thank you for all the blessings of life that you give us. Lord, we've talked about uh, things today that uh, sometimes can be very difficult. The decisions that we make, the choices we make, the the things that you bring upon us, the, the things, Lord, that happen to us, we, we sometimes begin to wonder. Uh, but Lord, we know that without a doubt, you're still in control. With a doubt, without a doubt, the Holy Spirit will lead us into what we need. And without a doubt that your covenant with us is just as strong as it was with Abraham. And Lord, that it's strong enough that we ought to understand uh, how severe it can be uh, if we break that covenant with you. Lord, we pray now that each of us might have gained some things from this lesson and that we might use them wisely in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.